Beloved Church of God, beginning our service before the Lord, let us stand, please, and affirm with the proclamation of the faith of our heart, the promise that relates to the door of our hope. Let the resurrection of Christ reign in our bodies. Amen. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are grateful to your holy name for this once again privilege to be in this place that your hand has outlined for the worship of your holy name. And so allow your inheritance in the name of the blood of the covenant to be lifted to high, it's higher than us, and to break all burden and sin that binds us. May in this service be cursed as before. All the works of devil, illnesses, poverty, premature death, demonic dependencies, all forms of fears, depression, destruction, selfishness, ignorance, all of this let it depart from the tents of your holy people. And stand, Lord, on the place of your rest, you and the ark of your might, and may your saints be clothed in your salvation, and may they rejoice before your countenance. Give us more from your Spirit and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Allow us to find your holy countenance. We thank you that this service is presented by Apostle Arkadi into your divine arms, and we ask you to continue to lead it with your high and uplifted hand, Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May you be blessed. Please be seated. I greet you, dear Church. Today we will read <clears throat> from the labors of pastor. The place of scripture that I would like to read with you is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you be clothed into the new man who is created according to God into righteousness and holiness of truth. Therefore, having set aside all lies, speak truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. I would like to also repeat the epigraph to the study of the Word of God. This is Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Then Jesus said to his disciples, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And so for us, as members of the body of Christ, to share with Christ the fulfillment of all that was written about him in Scripture, we will continue our study in the direction of our collaboration with the Holy Spirit and that what it is necessary for us to do on our end to receive the right to set aside our former way of life in order to clothe our bodies into a new way of life. According to these words, to set aside the former way of life in the face of our former life that ties us to our nation, to our household, and to our desires that come from the flesh, and to be clothed in a new way of life in the face of our new man in Christ Jesus. This is practically a command that calls us to perfection that is inherent to our Heavenly Father. And for the fulfillment of this command, there are three commanding verbs. We know them. This is to set aside, renew, and to clothe. And we understand that before we are clothed, it is necessary to fulfill specifically this requirement from us in order to set something aside. Oftentimes, we see an image where Pastor Daniel or Pastor Gadi, when they raise this cup and they say, for something to be placed inside this vessel, something else, it is necessary to pour out what was in there previously. So, to pour out this life out of us, and we are vessels of honor. And we need to be renewed, or rather take from another vessel, or another source, that liquid, and to fill this cup 
so that in this future we can partake of it. Given that we are vessels of honor, we need to fill ourselves with completely different contents. First, we need to set aside, renew, and to clothe. So to be renewed in our mind with the mind of Christ, after which it is necessary for us to be clothed into our new man, created by God in righteousness and holiness of truth. In a certain format, or in the boundaries of certain components, we have already looked at what our former life presents in itself and the sinful seed of our fathers in the flesh and what conditions are necessary to fulfill to set aside this vile way of life as well as what is the spirit of our mind and what conditions we need to fulfill to renew the sphere of our thinking with the spirit of our mind. And Pastor Arkadya writes, Therefore, we will turn to the third question. What conditions are necessary to fulfill to be clothed into our new man? He says, I think that for this goal, first it is necessary for us to have a clear definition. According to what criteria and signs should we define the characteristics of the new man? If we purchase or gain something, then as a rule, we need to look at the instructions for how to collect this. I know that as contractors, sometimes we hurry, we open a package up too quickly. And then having a picture in mind, we then put, put it together. And then in the middle, or perhaps the end, we understand that for some reason, this object doesn't work. There's a certain nail that wasn't in its place. But we were talking about how we specifically, there's a certain sequence that is supposed to be found in our spiritual life. And based on the revelations, fulfilling which will allow us to be called into the new man, so we can't make the first, second, or the second, third, or on the contrary, uh, we heard last week when we place that which is secondary in primary place in our life. This is very bad and this offends our Lord. And this I say first and foremost to myself. Regarding such a clothing into the new man, when this body remains in the third dimension state in the image, it is written about in w one of the parts of scripture and revelation when the wife the bride of the lamb prepared herself she was allowed to be clothed in fine linen clean and bright which carries the property and the characteristics of a new man the third dimension is the dimension of time that contains understanding of the past present and future we know it and the fourth dimension is a dimension of eternity that contain itself the understanding of omnipotence which rules over time and swallows up time. Time is defined and begins with the cry of suffering which discovers which is discovered by a newborn infant. Then there are all kinds of losses tied with this pains, tears, growing old, inconsistency, decay, haste, and ends with death. The Trinity for Saints is the victory of Christ that is defined and is discovered in unblemished joy, which wallows up all that is found in time. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from every faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Isaiah 25, 8-9 
So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 54-57 A new man, in whom we are called to be clothed in, contains in itself the dimension of eternity and time. And in scripture, under being clothed into the image of a new man is meant being clothed in fine linen, clean and bright, of which is said that this kind of linen is the righteousness of saints. And this kind of linen is given only to that category who in the dignity of the wife, the bride of the lamb, has prepared herself, and that first she has set aside her former way of life of the old man, growing corrupt in its deceitful lusts, and secondly, she renewed her thinking with the spirit of her mind, which is the mind of Christ. After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. They heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as a sound of many waters, and as a sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. If you have paid attention, then the image of this vision is an allegory or a parable, which concludes with the words, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in one of his parables, in which Jesus uncovers the essence of a marriage supper, it talks about how on this supper there was a person who entered there without marital marriage garments, for which he was thrown out. Matthew 22, 12 through 14. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Perhaps we might purchase beautiful clothes for ourselves. But these garments that this is referring to, these are those garments, if you remember, that the priests had worn inside. First, these were the garments on them that were invisible. Only the Lord knew of them. And these are the garments of salvation that we receive in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also know that to enter eternal life without having the garments of justification is impossible. And so people that have counted themselves worthy to enter eternal life, there are those who upon their life in the body were clothed into the new man, because of which they cannot be cast out. And to enter into the marriage supper of the Lamb without these proper garments is possible, which points to the fact that the marriage supper of the Lamb is time, when God uncovers the truth about the fact that it is necessary to set aside the image of the old man who grows corrupt according to his deceitful lusts. This truth talks about how to renew one's thinking with the spirit of the mind and how to be clothed into the new man, or with what means, at what place, and how one should conduct total sanctification 
to then conduct total, sing, total dedication to God. And if upon total sanctification we are separated from our nation, our household, and our corrupt lusts, and then we renew our thinking with the spirit of our mind, which in our spirit is the mind of Christ, and thus we fulfill our preparation to total dedication. Then upon total dedication, receive a revelation from God through instruction and faith, how? we ought to accept instructions about being clothed in our new man, which can be given by God only at the time when which we, as the wife and as the bride, has prepared herself or has fulfilled the conditions of total sanctification that are necessary for the fulfillment of conditions of our total dedications to serve the living and the true God. We will look at the clothing ourselves into the new man and seven components or seven definitions, each of which finds its definition and its expression in scripture, says Pastor Arkady. First, clothing oneself is being clothed in the garments of salvation. Clothed means to be clothed in marital garments, clothed in the robe of righteousness, crowned with the crown of a groom, adorned with the decor of the bride, clothed in fine linen, clean and bright, and demonstrating the representative power of Yahweh of hosts. Practically, these criteria and signs are contained the conditions that contain in themselves instructions, the fulfillment of which will help us to be clothed into the quality, dignity, and power of our new man that is contained and dwelling in Christ Jesus. The dignity of a new man and that tripartite dimension is expressed in the garments of a bride and wife of the Lamb. This is the dignity of a king, and we know this, the dignity of a prophet and the dignity of a priest. King is our renewed mind. which must be found in the correct place so that we can verify the source of information. These three unique dignities lay a responsibility upon a person to represent the perfection of his Heavenly Father in the dimension of three branches of government to carry out and to bring to fulfillment the judgment of righteousness, second, to establish the limits of a calling, and third, to fulfill the service of an intercessor. However, before we begin to look at these three unique dignities that are presented in the authority of God, that are presented in the dignities of our new man in Christ Jesus, we will need to study seven definitions that define the characteristics and criteria of the new man. And in the future, studying these seven signs will allow us to understand the instructions of dedication and dignity of a king, prophet, and priest. These three dignities in their totality will highlight how to define the signs of a new man as well as the conditions necessary to be clothed into the new man. The first five signs that define the face of the new man we will look at in the prophecy of the 66th chapter of Isaiah. We will look at the sixth one in the 19th chapter of Revelation. And Job chapter 39 is where we'll see the seventh one. And we will rely also on other places of scripture which will verify given that dependent on scripture in order to affirm and to give a legal basis to some kind of holy principle there need to be the presence of two or three witnesses from Scripture. And so, to study the first five signs that define the essence of the new man, we will turn to the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 66, 10 through 11. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. For the Lord has clothed me in the robe of righteousness, he has clothed me in the robe of righteousness and has laid a crown. And as a bride, he is adorned. 
For as the earth produces its plants, so the Lord will reveal his righteousness and glory before all the people. According to this testimony, joy in God and the gladness of the soul in the Lord is the result that comes from being clothed into the new man that is presented in this prophecy in five signs. We have already noted one unchanging principle that each time it talks about how God has done something for man, it means the fact that previously a person on his end had to fulfill certain conditions also, which would allow God to fulfill for a person the promise that God has placed on his account in Christ Jesus. From this it follows that in order for God to clothe the person in the robe of salvation, he had to fulfill the conditions established by God. As we mentioned, garments are, is, are garments that go on the body. Uh, it was without sleeves. It was like a holy mantle that went down to the ground and it covered a person. And given that these garments are called garments of salvation, we need to remember what is salvation, what are we saved from, who are we saved by, through what are we saved, and what kind of salvation are we referring to. Specifically, there exist two forms of salvation that pers that follow one another, and that they and that flow from one another. Each of these forms has its own levels that are tied to growth and faith. And each of this is the redemption of God and is given based on certain conditions. The first form of salvation is given to us in the form of a seed as a deposit. If a deposit, upon fulfilling certain actions, commandments, statutes, will not be placed into circulation, or rather will not be grown, we will lose our salvation, and we will turn ourselves into the category of the called. pastor says this thought that these people that are called, they oftentimes become lawless and wicked, who turn themselves into lawless people. First they were not so, and they accepted salvation with joy, but then they did not place it into circulation. We remember that parable about the talents. It was like that wicked servant with one talent. Instead of placing it into circulation, he buries it and doesn't care for it, doesn't worry about it, and doesn't collaborate with God in order to receive the second form of salvation. And when the master returns, he just returned it with nothing. Because of which our names will be blotted out of the eternal book of life. Matthew 22, 11 through 14. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by the fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from you you who practice lawlessness in one other place of scripture Matthew 22 11 through 14 but when the king came in to see the guests he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment so he said to him friend how did you come in here without a wedding garment he was speechless then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The second form of salvation is given as a guarantee in the format of the fruit offered that is necessary to keep and to multiply. Revelation 3, 10-11 because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. 
Revelation 2, 26-29, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In this case, upon being clothed in the garment of salvation, we are dealing with the second form of salvation, which is a guarantee that the author and finisher of our faith will not blot out our names out of the book of life. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will, blot, I will not blot out his name from the book of life. In scripture, the word salvation is defined as pure, holy, and imperishable inheritance placed on our account in Christ Jesus, which is called to be kept for us in Christ Jesus in heaven. In the words of holy scripture, in the words of our hearts, because of which salvation, upon representing our nat nature in scripture, it includes two forms, and these are never separated. Salvation is help, deliverance, being kept, release, safety, building material, eternal life, justification, royal dignity, splendor, adornments, the power of the future age, splendor, flourishment, joy, eternal inheritance, and the kingdom of heaven. And so in short definitions, we have answered the question, what is salvation? Or according to what characteristics should we define it? The next question, who or what are we saved from? At first glance, the question is clear. We are saved from the program of eternal perdition, from hell and eternal death, which we inherited from the sinful seed of our fathers from whom we were born. Psalms 51, 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. However, the program of death that is contained in our essence, and that accumulates our life in the flesh, and formulates our essence into its image, points the arrows to our nation, household, and our fleshly desires, and then we need to withstand not just against the program, but against those that are near and dear to our heart. And we know what this is. There are those that collaborate with this program and enable this program. And if we are not freed from these three institutes of authority, then it will be difficult for us. When I heard the word, and we expressed the desire to be a part of members of the Church Immovable Foundation Church, I went to my father. And in that moment, as I understood it, I tried to read a few places of scripture and to explain where I'm going, to what church I'm going. He didn't listen to me to the end, and when he heard what kind of group I'm going to, and that group at that time had, there was information spoken about it, that they were Satanists, they were doing this or that. He said, I had a son and I lost him. It happened that he told this to our people and they just turned their backs to us. From my end, I, ex I made this decision, or my father made the decision, and they just turned away from us. And for more than two years, there was no phone call, no question, nothing. And as I testified to himself and my older sister, then I, there was a vacuum in me. No fellowship. Imagine you go to a different country. You don't understand the language. No one understands your language and you're alone. What are you going to do? This is what happened with me. But the Lord helped me. 
and that I was met with completely different information. These labors of pastor were not on paper yet, but they were all on cassettes. And then our group was small. There was about 14 of us, 14, 16. And we also began to meet in houses. We just listened to cassettes together, prayed these same psalms, sang these psalms, and the Lord filled us with himself and gave us this information through which we could step by step be rid of these three institutes of authority, the house of our father, our nationality, our nation, confessions, our corrupt desires. And of course, this is a process and I think it will not conclude for many, many more years to come. And we need to withstand not just in the face of demons, devil, temptations, but also among people, or rather to stand for this truth among persecution. And when we, through the knowledge of the truth and the power of the blood of Christ and the power of the cross of Christ, are rid from these three enemies that form us into their image, then against us step out the next enemy. These are carnal people in union with dead religion or in dead faith in the face of saints that have sold their birthright, that have an appearance of godliness, but have rejected the power of its godliness. And this enemy is far more difficult. Others might say that they exist, but this enemy comes as if a beautiful angel with beautiful words. But here we have to be very attentive. And their image of worship is highlighted well as the prophets of the Old Testament and the words of the apostles. Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 8 through 11. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. And then, to help comes seven properties of the Spirit which we grew in ourselves, thanks to which we renew our thinking, which gives us the power to withstand them and to overcome them. The next question, who are we saved by or what are we saved through? At the head of our salvation stands the Heavenly Father who sent His word through the Law of Moses and Prophets. And then on the basis of the Law and Prophets, He sent His Son so that He could become the captain of our salvation. When the Son of God fulfilled His mission on the earth, having paid for our redemption before the Father with His death on the cross, and he gave the mandate of his powers to his disciples. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. In other words, the apostles received not just a analogical mandate that Christ had, but also the Holy Spirit that had to guide them and clothe them with his strength. As a result of such a mandate or such messengership, which is equal to the messengership of the author and finisher of our faith, the captain of our salvation, this mandate, according to Scripture and the Holy Spirit, began to be passed on to future generations, husbands and wives, that the Holy Spirit has distinguished with the seal of His authority and wisdom. Relying on this mandate of the representative power, Apostle Paul could boldly say, that all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. 
2 Corinthians 1, 20 through 21. From these words it follows that not one promise can be realized by a person without collaboration with the representative power or authority of those whom God has sent and anointed. In other words, the final instance through which we receive our salvation is the truth of Scripture that we receive through instruction and faith, anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the last question, what kind of form of salvation are we referring to? For the category of people that God has clothed in the robes of salvation in the face of their new man, this kind of salvation is founded not on their faith but on the hope of their blessed and glorious trust. For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with all patience. Romans 8, 22 through 25. It is impossible to wait in patience that which is not in the heart. Faith is necessary for us to be able to draw draw water from this glorious treasury. If a person does not have hope, he will not have faith. Oftentimes, people think that they have faith. But when they are tested for their faith, they fall away from faith. But when they have hope, then upon any trials, they can keep their faithfulness that is proclaimed by them in faith. Titus 2, 1 through 14. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This was the scripture was Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 23. Faith that moves in the present time. Hope looks into the future. Faith does not have the potential of anticipation. This potential is found in hope. It is hope that feeds and upholds our faith, or rather our faithfulness to the teaching that is pre proclaimed by us. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Titus 2:13 through 14 and again, Hebrews 10.35, Therefore do not cast away your trust, which has great reward. Trust is founded in hope. The authenticity of trust is always verified by boldness. These two dignities never work without one another. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, as we know, boldness is the right to enter into the sanctuary through two truths, with which we can acknowledge through instruction and faith. This is the truth about the blood of Christ and about the cross of Christ. Proverbs 22:19. So that your trust may be in the Lord, I have instructed you today, even you. In the moment when, according to the lusts of the wicked that are found among the nation of God, there occur all kinds of lies, slander, and as a sword. In the congregation of saints, only those that have the dignity of a disciple will not be led away into perdition. It is the dignity of a disciple that gives a holy person the ability to lay his trust in God. Not an inspector, but specifically a disciple. Jeremiah thirty nine eighteen. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword. For your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me. 
says the Lord. Trust expressed in the garments of salvation is wisdom in the heart of a person which a person gained through instruction and faith. Look at the guarantees that are given to those that trust in God. Psalms 91, 3 through 16. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Psalms 91, that is well known to us. We must test and verify our trust, what it is founded on, on the flesh and the subject of intellectual and emotional ties, or to the faith of the heart, which we in time accepted through instruction and faith. Because in the first case, the result of these two opposing trust is the fact that the heart of a person will depart from the Lord because of which he will not be capable of offering the fruit of truth. In the second case, a person will endure the blessing of God and that as a tree he will plant it by the river of the revelations of God. Jeremiah 17, 5-8 Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when he comes, but its leaf will be green. It will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. The hope of trust in the robes of salvation is the tree of life that grows in the heart of a person, the fruits of the tree of life. are the fruits of the wisdom of God that result in God's favor upon a person and uncover God's clouds that are filled with dew. The image of this dew uncovers that form of salvation that comes to us through instruction and faith. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happier are all who retain her. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth, by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the depths were broken up, and clouds dropped down the dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be the life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. Proverbs 3, 12 through 23. The next sign of being clothed into the new man is presented in this prophecy in five signs. The second sign is, he clothed me in the robe of righteousness.
we should note that just like in the previous sign, if God has done something or does something for a person, then the factor is always intended that a person must fulfill certain conditions that allow God or would allow God to fulfill for a person that promise that God has placed on his account in Christ Jesus. For God to clothe the person in the robe of righteousness, he had to fulfill conditions established by God, which he could receive and understand through instruction and faith. In Hebrew, the robe of righteousness are also garments or a holy mantle that is placed on top of the robe or the garments of salvation. And when we look at the clothing of the chosen remnant of God in the garments of a priest, then we will see the undergarments and the outer garments. The undergarments out of linen and the outer garments that were for priests. To find the dignity of a virtuous wife, scripture says that she is not afraid of snow for her household because all her household is clothed in double garments. Proverbs 31, 21. She is not afraid of snow for her household for all her household is clothed in double garments. And given that these garments are called garments of righteousness, we will need to remember what is righteousness or according to what criteria should we define it? How and in what way are we justified? What are we justified through? And what kind of righteousness in this case are we referring to? In scripture, there exist two forms of salvation as well as two forms of righteousness or two forms of justice which cannot be existing without one another because they flow from one another and they follow one another. Each of these forms has its levels that are tied to growth and faith. And each of these forms is the redemption of God and is given to a person and accepted by a person upon certain conditions. The first form of righteousness a person receives at the moment of his acceptance of his salvation, if, of course, he accepts this on the conditions of God. The character of this kind of righteousness is well presented by Apostle Paul in the letter to Romans chapter 3, verses 21-24. through 24. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In this case, we are referring to our new birth from hearing the word of truth or from our inner man. This kind of righteousness cannot be the robe of righteousness because we receive it in that form of salvation that is a deposit which must be placed into circulation. And only when our circulation will bring us a reward we will receive the right to be clothed in the garments of salvation or into the new man. And so the second form of righteousness which we receive through instruction and faith is the reward that clothes us in the powers of the fear of the Lord and makes us capable of distinguishing good from evil and practicing righteousness in the works of justice. He who is just, let him be just still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Revelation 22, 11-12 What is interesting is that the component of affirming justice in prayer is one of the dignities that highlights the other dignities. And as we have mentioned before, if there is no dignity of justice, then all the other dignities would stop being dignities because of which the discipline of justice in the minds and mouths of people more than any other truth is subjected to intensive attacks from organized powers of darkness because without the component or justice of justice God would stop being God 
and service to God would turn into service to Satan. But due to the unchanging word of God, this can never happen. According to affirmation in scripture, only thanks to justice that the righteous will be rewarded for their righteousness and will be delivered from the peril of the wicked. Whereas the wicked, thanks to this very same justice, will receive full retribution for their lawlessness and for troubling the righteous. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Second Thessalonians 1, 6 through 10 According to such a definition, and it is not the only one in Scripture, we can boldly say that, first, any kind of teaching that is founded on so-called the grace of God, which guarantees salvation to people irregardless of their worthy repentance, is a lie and cannot be affirmed by anything. It is incorrect stronghold of salvation. Second, if a person accepts salvation and does not change his way of thinking, his words, his actions, he lies to himself. Third, if this person is allowed into heaven, then he even there would not learn righteousness. And would not look upon the greatness of the Lord. Isaiah 26.10 if the wicked be shown grace, he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. And therefore, the true dignity in the subject of double garments can be had by only a person who, in time, had accepted justification as a gift of grace through redemption in Christ Jesus. And on the other hand, on the basis of that very same scripture, he practices righteousness according to the norms that are highlighted in scripture. As a result, we have the need in greater detail to study these garments of righteousness. And for this, we need to define first the origin of the robe of righteousness, the purpose that is contained in the robe of righteousness, the conditions necessary to be clothed in the robes of righteousness, and fourth, the reward for having and keeping the robes of righteousness. So the first question, what does scripture say about the root out of which flows the dignity expressed in justice, or out of what material are the robes of righteousness made from? The origin or the root of justice. The origin of robes of righteousness can happen only through the root of righteousness. Therefore, to be clothed and to the robe of righteousness in the works of justice, it is necessary to be righteous according to our origin. And of course, a, the somebody that is righteous by nature or by origin is God. Isaiah 53, 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, and he shall bear their iniquities. From this prophecy it follows that the material out of which the robes of righteousness are made is gained through knowledge of God. Whereas being clothed in the robe of righteousness is a demonstration of righteousness through the proclamation of the faith of faith of the heart and righteousness. From all of this it follows, says Pastor, that the righteousness of the heart is the first form of the robe of righteousness, whereas the proclamation of the righteousness of heart of the heart is a second form of the robe of righteousness. According to this logical 
statement, one cannot become righteous by progressing, by doing some kind of good works. He needs to be born and then to grow in righteousness and to practice righteousness. 1 John 2, 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. The works of righteousness are good works, and to define good works should be done according to the source of their origin. Any kind of virtue that comes from the flesh is evil and challenges the righteousness of God. Uh, with this I will conclude. We will pray. Let us pray and thank the Lord for that word that we had the opportunity to have. Let us be blessed in our prayers. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for today's service, for your word. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for his death, for his resurrection, for his mighty word that cleanses and washes us that makes us strong, that strengthens our faith. We thank you, Lord, that you today uncover the meaning of your word with which you fill us, which lays in our heart. It affirms our hope, which is the undiminishing potential of God. We thank you for this place upon which you have placed a remembrance to your holy name. The enemy has tried to take this place from us, but you have left it. We thank you, Lord, for your anointed one, through which or whom we receive this truth, our pastor at Gadi. May he be blessed and his house in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you cleanse us from all kinds of false strongholds of salvation, so-called good works that are made by our intellect, and you teach us that good works that are done in Christ Jesus, that are not works of the flesh, only they can be called good works. We thank you, Lord, for your church, for your Zion. for your order. I thank you, Lord, that you give us the right to power to set aside our former way of life, to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and to be clothed in a new way of life, the mind of Christ, in righteousness and holiness of truth. With a noise, may the power of death be cast out of our essence and in its place let the power of eternal life be raised up in Christ Jesus. We thank you, our Lord. We worship you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us proclaim our judging manifestation. Now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory and unblemished joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.